London, September 6th, 1978. Keith Moon is the drummer for rock giants The Who. For the past decade, he's been one of the most outrageous performers in rock and roll. Keith Moon was an octopus. Nobody had ever seen a drummer like that. He's a drumming genius whose talents are overshadowed by his wild man ways. It was like a time bomb. You never know when he was going to go off. Keith's life was a non-stop party from the day he joined the Who to the day he died. When it comes to self-destruction, Moon is Rock's poster boy. I don't know how he survived, as long as he did. And soon, the curtain will drop on the clown prince of rock and roll. This is the last 24 hours in the life of Keith Moon. September 6th, 1978. It's early afternoon, and Keith Moon, legendary drummer of rock supergroup The Who, is, as usual, sleeping in. He and his latest girlfriend have, for the last few months, been living at fellow musician Harry Nilsson's apartment in London's West End. It's the same apartment where, four years earlier, singer Mama Cass died of a heart attack. And, in just 24 hours, Keith Moon will also be dead. For the last few weeks, Moon has been basking in the attention given to The Who's latest album, Who Are You? Who Are You is coming out the 21st of August. <laughs> um, That's our album, you know. That's the album. <laughs> As it races up the charts, Who Are You is on its way to becoming both a critical and a commercial success. The Who had uh, just released um, the album, Who Are You? They were in the media, uh, they were uh, all over the press, and um, Keith was back in the public eye. For the moment, things are going well for Moon, especially with his girlfriend, former Swedish model, Annette walter Lax. He was very cuddly, he was very lovable. He would say, God, I love you so much, and I'm so appreciative that you can still be here. As well, Keith Moon, a struggling alcoholic, finally seems to be putting his life back together. He could be like, uh, like a teddy bear. I mean, he was the nicest man you could ever find. But it didn't take much alcohol or anything else to turn him into something completely different. After drinking hard for more than 10 solid years, the lifestyle has more than caught up with him. Keith had drunk himself really into the ground, I mean, really hard. And you see the pictures of him in his early 30s, and he looks like he's in his 40s or, or, or worse. In control of your life at all? Oh, yeah, well, certain days. Certain, certain days, days. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you like the other days? Uh, drunk. For years, Moon has tried to control what has become a very dangerous habit. Out of desperation, he's turned to a drug called heminevrin, an alcohol withdrawal medication. Heminevrin was a very, very strong drug, uh, the kind of drug that should probably only be administered in hospitals. Ironically, in less than 23 hours, his life will be cut short by an overdose of the very pills that are meant to save him. I mean, it's absolutely ludicrous to give it to someone like Keith, who's used to just downing whatever there is. I mean, his pill intake was phenomenal. Keith Moon's larger-than-life appetite for booze and pills has been fueled by a life spent at the very top of the rock and roll food chain. For the last decade, Moon and his band, The Who, have dominated the world of rock. They first blasted onto the scene as part of the British invasion. No one had ever heard or seen anything like them before. The first time you heard my generation, I went, what was that? 
Everybody knew the Beatles and the Stones, but we didn't know that there was going to be a tidal wave of bands coming from England. And everybody wanted to say, well, who is this band, The Who? The Who were the godfathers of punk. They couldn't care less about yesterday and even less about tomorrow. The music matched the anger. They smashed their guitars, and we were like, what? You know, I've never seen anything like that. They were just phenomenal stage band. You know, there was no band that could touch them. But the Who were also musical innovators. They moved from three-minute amphetamine-fueled teen anthems to psychedelia, from psychedelia to genre-busting rock opera. And at the band's center was Keith Moon. Who was this drummer? Nobody had ever seen a drummer like that. I mean, Ringo was a great drummer. Charlie Watts was a great drummer. Keith Moon was an octopus. He was all over the place, and to this day is still the best rock drummer of all time. Before Keith came along, the drummer was just a, a guy who sat in the back and kept the beat. And he really was the first person, first drummer, to, to become a frontman drummer. He was really sort of and the most watchable drummer there was. You know, you could watch him, because drummers, they're not that visually interesting, but Keith used to put on little performances. And for his finale, he would often smash his kit to pieces. But Moon was as explosive off as he was on the stage. Keith is the epitome of the bad hotel smashing over the top rock star. We'd been in some hotel room and he'd look at all this wreckage in the hotel room and he was sitting there thinking, you know, I think this is one of my best. <laughs> Moon's crazy antics were also witnessed by fellow drummer Kenny Jones. I was in a room next door to him and I, I could hear this um, scraping and stuff like that and I thought, what, what's that? I think we're like rats or mice or something. And all of a sudden, the wall started to move forward. And then it sort of, Keith burst through. I said, fancy a drink? <laughs> it's great. He just chopped his way through the wall. Moon's practical jokes were the stuff of legend. Once armed with an inflatable doll, Moon paraded through town, pretending to indulge in a naughty and very public act. He's got the mic and through the big loudspeakers at the front, he's going, oh, 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 let me go, let me go. Don't take him down. <laughs> it's like, like, like a girl in distress. And everybody's looking in the car saying, oh, there's some of them, you know, being molested in the back of that Bentley. And the coppers come in and they're going, oh, it's a joke. Moon marched to his own beat. His madcap ways soon earned him the tag, Moon the Loon. Keith was a showman, but he was also a clown. He was just, I mean, he was naturally funny. One of his tricks was to, if you're in a restaurant, he wasn't getting attention or whatever, he'd strip off naked and lie on the table. He always made you laugh. He always had a laugh there for you. The spotlights will be on him if he was at the party. I mean, he just, uh, oh, there is Keith Moon. Let's see what he's going to do. Wherever he went, Keith Moon was the life of the party. And madcap Keith Moon entertains the crowd at the celebrity party. If you dared him to do anything, he would do it. And he was great to be around with because he was alive, he was a personality. And that was the greatest thing about Keith. But Moon's crazy antics didn't always amuse. His partying ways were affecting his playing on stage. He was often late for rehearsals or concerts. The rest of the Who were growing impatient with Moon the Loon. Pete got older, Keith, and just said, listen, this is it. You're, you know, it's no more messing around. You can't cut it. If you can't cut it, you're going to be out of the band, which for Keith was the end of the world, you know. But on September 6th, 1978, enjoying the success of the band's latest album, Moon is doing everything he can to stay away from drinking. But on this day, 
it's not the bottle he has to worry about. September 6th, 1978, 4 p.m. For the past few months, rock drummer Keith Moon has been staying at a London flat, desperately trying to gain control over his addiction to booze. To help him, he's been prescribed heminevrin, a drug designed to wean addicts off alcohol. And so far, things are going rather well. But in 23 hours, he'll be dead. On this particular afternoon, Keith Moon is struggling with whether or not to attend the star-studded bash tonight thrown by his good friend, Paul McCartney. For someone trying to keep his drinking under control, the party sounds like a bad idea. You know, I'm sure that Keith thought, you know, on one hand, I want to go to this party, see friends. On the other hand, you know, I'm going to have to... Am I, am I going to be able to not drink? Am I... Is something else going to be offered to me in the bathrooms? Am I... Am I going to expect to jump on the table and get naked like I used to do and have so much fun doing? And I'm sure that Keith felt that if he went to this party, people would expect things from him. However, this is not an invitation you turn down. But his girlfriend, Annette, is keen to go. I was probably showing disappointment. I mean, of course, I've been looking forward to this big event. It was the biggest event of the year in London that year. In part, Moon is concerned that, sober, his friends will find him rather boring. I think he was finding being Keith Moon was an awful difficult thing to keep going because people expect him to pull his amazing uh, practical jokes and stories all the time. Keith had to be the centre of attention everywhere. You know, whether it was on stage playing with The Who, or afterwards backstage in a dress room, or in a club, or in a car, or waiting in a corridor, or anywhere. Keith had to be the centre of attention. Moon the Loon's urge to be centre stage began early. He was born Keith John Moon on August 23rd, 1946, in the very ordinary West London suburb of Wembley. His mother, Kathleen, was a housewife, and his father, Alfred, a mechanic. From the very start, young Keith did everything he could to stand out from the rest. Keith just seemed to be imbued with, like, a mischievousness and a creativity, and that's a creativity that most people loved because he could be so entertaining. He could also get himself into trouble. Hardly a model student, one teacher labelled the young Moon artistically retarded and idiotic. No one knew that behind that mischievous energy was what would now probably be diagnosed as a bad case of ADD, or attention deficit disorder. So what you have is this kid who's running around like crazy, exp exhibiting all the, all the, the natural signs of kind of ADD and, and hyperactivity. And people say, Ah, uh, you know, there's a character, or he'll grow out of it, or, you know, what a, what a lot of energy that kid has. And at age 14, Keith Moon dropped out of school. As a way of focusing his boundless energy, his parents encouraged his interest in music, and he fell in love with the drums. The drums allowed a sense of rebellion, because the drums are a noisy instrument, and people often don't like hearing people playing drums in a terrace, you know, street of terraced houses. Um, so they, they represent the chance to, you know, basically piss people off. Keith did not want to be an ordinary drummer. While most young percussionists in Britain were imitating the rock-steady style of the day, Keith Moon found his muse in the crazed drumming of American jazz great Gene Krupa. Gene Krupa was probably his blueprint, because Gene Krupa did things that nobody else did either. He was very theatrical. You look at the old things of Gene Krupa, and he's always... Keith Moon developed some kind of style that was so bizarre, he was Gene Krupa. Moon practiced every chance he could. Word traveled fast around London of Moon's over-the-top style. And in April 1964, after playing in a few local groups, he auditioned for one of London's hottest young bands, The Who. As usual, Keith made sure to make a big impression. Keith's in the audience with his ginger suit and his ginger hair and his ginger everything and says, I can drum better than him, you know, of The Who's drummer. 
and Pete Townsend liking the cockiness of the uh, of the situation said, "Well, go on then, give it a try." After ending his audition by breaking the drum kit, the Who hired him on the spot. Keith Moon was only 17 years old. Within a very short period, Keith had joined the band. He's got to learn all the numbers and learn to get on with the other guys and, you know, fit in. But within a, just a few weeks, they're in the studio recording. The Who were at the vanguard of a new British subculture called the Mods. Kicking against stuffy post-war values, they wore sharp suits and drove Italian scooters. It's almost as though the country went from black and white to colour, sort of overnight, and Keith was at the perfect age to, to jump into this co new colourful world. For Keith Moon, determined to stand out from the crowd, he couldn't have picked a better band. The Who were all about Flash. The Who were the archetypal mod band. They were very, very sharp fashion-wise. Keith was really sharp. He quickly uh, developed this uh, look of having a, a mod symbol. It's just the RAF symbol, the red, white and blue target. He would wear that on a T-shirt. It's, it's, it's one of these pure symbols and never dies. But The Who were also getting high with the mod's drug of choice. Speed. Speed that makes you really thirsty, so then you drink more, you know, then you stay up all night, and then, then you're off in a different zone. Now you're, now you're in the party world. For a teenager hell-bent on grabbing every shred of attention, the endless flow of speed and booze gave Moon license to be as loud and as outrageous as he wanted. A witness to Moon's early pill-popping was close friend Richard Barnes. I got out my amphetamine pills, and I had, I don't know, about 18 of them. And he stuck the lot in one, he went right and put them in his face. I think that's, that's probably enough to kill you. It just took them. It's incredible, and went on and played. Fueled by alcohol and speed, the Who soon changed the face of live rock and roll forever. They were playing at the Railway Hotel Club, which was a basement below a pub, and it had a low ceiling. So Pete used to do this thing where he's playing, where he just put his guitar up like that. And he put it up and it went through the ceiling. You know, broke the ceiling, and he broke the neck off the guitar. During The Who's next performance, not to be outdone, Keith Moon joined in on the mayhem. Keith just smashed up his drum kit after the set was finished which was great. He kicked his drum kit over, so he bashed it to bits. Things like that, Keith should get the credit for, because if Keith hadn't have done that, Pete would never have smashed up a guitar again. Rock and roll would never be the same again. But now, more than a decade later, in his London flat, still mulling over whether or not to attend Paul McCartney's big bash, Keith Moon is worried that without a drink or two, he can't possibly live up to that larger-than-life reputation. And in late afternoon, determined to stay on the wagon, he comes up with an alternative solution. Keith made a phone call and somebody came a couple of hours later with some cocaine. He would have his contacts. Yeah, like every uh, rock and roller. And they'd be delivered. Simple as that. It's like having a pizza delivered now. There's, there's no dispute or doubt that once Keith became a real alcoholic, he developed a big uh, cocaine habit as well. It became much more visible to other members of the Who, and they were troubled by it. Moon slips away to take care of business. But Annette is hardly blind to what's going on. I think I said something to him, oh, have you taken that stuff? And I, I was worried. <laughs> Moon's system now contains cocaine and hemineverin, his anti-alcohol medication. Buzzed from the cocaine, Moon does an about-face. Now he's ready to party. After that, he changed his mind, and he wanted to go to the party. I think he registered my disappointment and did it for my sake. He did it for me. 
It's one favor she would later wish he'd refused. September 6th, 1978, 9 p.m., London. Drum legend Keith Moon has only 18 hours left to live. He and his girlfriend, Annette Walter Lax, are on their way to a party being thrown by ex-Beatle Paul McCartney. It's a pre-screening bash for the launch of the film The Buddy Holly Story. Earlier, for fear of being tempted to drink, Moon had been reluctant to attend. But thanks to a few lines of coke, he quickly changed his mind. From the second he arrives, Keith is treated like true rock royalty and is given the best seat in the house. Keith was at the main table. He sat with Paul and Linda McCartney. He's not off at some side table with the side musicians. Uh, he's, he's, he's at the main table. Also on hand are famous British talk show host David Frost and Kenny Jones, ex-drummer for The Faces. Keith and I just went straight into each other, just talking, because we hadn't seen each other for a while. I said, well, how about you, Keith? What have you been like? He said, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm clean, I'm straight, I'm... And he was telling me that he'd, he'd given up drinking for nearly six months, and he felt so much better. For partygoers, Keith's calm behaviour comes as something of surprise. One of those who's taken aback is BBC radio personality Annie Nightingale. He seemed very subdued and not that the crazy Keith, you know, putting all kinds of jokes. For girlfriend Annette, the change in Keith comes as a welcome relief. I felt like for once I was relaxing with him. I felt safe and I could probably for the first time enjoy a party with him as a normal couple. It was wonderful. Dealing with Moon's crazy rock and roll antics has never been easy for the women in his life. Twelve years earlier, just as the swinging 60s slipped into gear and girls were throwing themselves at the band, Keith Moon once again did the unexpected. He became a husband and father. Keith fell in love with a, a girl from Bournemouth called Kim Kerrigan. Keith was young, she was even younger. He gets her pregnant. Perhaps influenced by the conservative values of his upbringing, Moon decided to do the right thing. He married Kim. At 19 and completely unprepared, the crazed drummer was now a family man. I don't think he was ready to be a father. I mean, I don't think he was a really a good father or a bad father. I don't think he was around enough to have really been either. In love with Keith, Kim made the best of a difficult situation. Kim was an absolute saint, really, to put up with him. But for Kim, living with her superstar husband would soon get worse. On January 4th, 1970, Keith's heavy partying took a tragic turn. It was a very dark, black, stormy night, the sort of night where you don't go out. And, um... I didn't want to go particularly, but he said, come on, come on, dear boy. So, you know, with all the enthusiasm that the guy had, so, all right, all right, we'll go. There was a opening of a disco just outside London, and it was the kind of thing that Keith didn't need to be doing, but he agreed to open this disco in a pub because, hey, it seemed like a fun night out. As the event came to a close, Moon, Kim, and their entourage were ready to leave. At Moon's side was his old friend, Larry Smith. I said to Keith, OK, we, we snipped the ribbon, we've had a few beers, had some champagne, let's just go. But outside the club, a group of drunken skinheads took offence to Moon's flashy clothes and fancy car. The noise was deafening inside the car. They were pounding on the roof, kicking the sides of the doors. Well, they would have killed us if they'd have gone into the car. To protect the car and his passengers, Moon's friend and driver, Neil Boland, jumped out to confront the violent skinheads. Keith's driver was a guy called Neil Boland, who was not one of the professional security people you would employ now. Keith was always employing friends. Left in gear, 
Moon's car began to lurch forward. Moon slipped into the driver's seat and guided the vehicle as it rolled down a hill away from the angry mob. But in the commotion, Neil Boland fell under the wheels and was dragged under the car, crushing him to death. It basically fell on Keith's shoulders that one way or another he had been responsible for the death of his friend, and Keith got very, very, very low. Although later exonerated in court, the guilt was too deep to shake. Moon found solace in the bottle and in the company of groupies. But in Moon's idea of marriage, adultery was not a two-way street. He was so jealous, you see. He would go out and, and run around with women, but if she ever dared look at another man or do anything, he'd go mad. In 1973, after years of drunken abuse, Kim finally decided to leave the marriage, taking with her seven-year-old Amanda. September 6th, 1978, London. Drum legend Keith Moon and his girlfriend Annette are at Paul McCartney's pre-screening party for the film The Buddy Holly Story. It's 11 p.m. and Moon has only 16 hours left to live. Initially abstaining from drink, Moon finally gives in and has a couple of glasses of champagne. He now has alcohol, cocaine, and his anti-booze drug, Heminevrin, in his system. Keith Moon's girlfriend, Annette, leaves him at the table and heads to the dance floor. While she's on the dance floor, he's apparently telling everybody how much he loves her and that he's, he wants to marry her, and he, he doesn't tell her. I heard afterwards that he had planned to ask me to marry him the next day. To actually hear that he said it to other people that night, for the first time in years, Keith Moon's love life seems balanced and healthy. But less than five years earlier, following his ugly separation from his wife, Kim, Moon's life was in a complete freefall. And on November 20th, 1973, at a concert in San Francisco, it all came crashing to the ground. Someone passed him some drugs, which um, which I think they turned out to be that kind of horse tranquilizers. Moon was completely unaware of the potency of the pills. As they reached the middle of the Who's 70s anthem, Won't Get Fooled Again, Keith suffered a total collapse. Unable to finish the concert, Moon was dragged backstage unconscious. The Who being consummate professionals, the show had to go on. Scott Halpin, a 19-year-old kid from Iowa, stepped in, playing the rest of the show. For Moon, the message was clear. He could be replaced. Roger came up to me at one stage and said, you better tell him uh, to get his act together or if he's out, he's out of the band. Soon after, the band took a break from touring. And then, one evening in 1974, in a London nightclub, he spotted a beautiful young Swedish model, Annette Walter Lax. He saw Annette sit down there with a boyfriend, and he gave £10 for the bouncer to throw the boyfriend out, which they duly did. Uh, yeah, my, my date left, and I was stuck there with this Keith, who, who was just... He just mesmerised me. Keith chatted her up with a bottle of Dom Perignon, and uh, that's how they uh, ended up. I was adventurous. I was young. I was a rebel. I didn't know who Keith Moon was. I had no idea. Having won her heart, Moon stole Annette off to L.A., where he hoped to change his life around. He was already a superstar. Maybe he didn't need the who after all. Let Les make records. Determined on shaping his own destiny with or without the who, he began to record what would be his first and only solo album, Two Sides of the Moon. But the album was anything but a rousing success. 
They must have sold all of 50 copies, you know. Apparently, it's one of the most expensive records ever made. They had a non-stop party on that record. They had fleets of limousines. You know, it cost an absolute fortune. It went on and on and on. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. Surrounded by all the temptations of Hollywood, Keith Moon now took his partying to new all-time highs. It was very hard to sort of keep up with the lifestyle of the celebrities. I mean, they were called in all the time, and Keith as well, of course, being, being the, the party guy that he was. He wanted attention. He needed that. He wanted that. Now, four years later, back in London, Moon is determined to stop that downward spiral. It's 1 a.m., and after attending Paul McCartney's party, he decides to leave partway through the screening of the Buddy Holly story. He was restless, and he said, I can't sit through this, I don't want to watch this. Let's go. Uncharacteristically, Annette and Keith call it an early night and head home. We said goodbye to each other, and he went off. And that was it, really. That's the last time Keith and I saw each other. Moon doesn't know it, but the very drug that's meant to save him is on the brink of destroying him. In 14 hours, he'll be dead. September 7th, 1978, 2 a.m. Keith Moon has only 13 hours to live. After attending a party and special screening for the Buddy Holly story, Keith Moon and his girlfriend, Annette Walter Lax, return to their flat. Moon has been taking large amounts of hemonevrin, a drug prescribed to help him with his alcohol withdrawal and insomnia. I didn't know they were dangerous. I didn't see them as dangerous because they were prescribed by the doctor. So I trusted the situation. But as with everything else in his life, Moon's been overdoing it and completely ignoring the recommended dosage. The effect of hemonevering is that that you feel you feel you feel drunk if you take them. You should have them in hospital by nurses or doctors that can see how many tablets they, you get per hour or whatever. I didn't know that then. Annette is used to watching him take all these pills and being um, really not particularly educated to what this is all about, is thinking, well, at least they're meant to be good pills. Um, you know, it's better than the bad pills. They were supposed to make him sober. They were supposed to make him stop wanting to drink alcohol. That's what I know. As Moon gets ready for bed, he asks Annette to fix him some food. He was hungry when he got back, so I went to the kitchen. I, I knew we had some, some lamb, as a matter of fact. He loved lamb. He had that, and he wanted to watch this film. With a belly full of food and hemonevrin, Keith Moon finally drifts off to sleep. Moon's serious attempt at kicking the bottle began over a year ago with the announcement from The Who that they were planning to record a new album. Who are you? He left his home in LA and headed back to London for the recording. But throughout the recording sessions, Moon continued to drink heavily. I remember him in the recording studios trying to do it sober, and um, he couldn't do it. He was just screaming out for brandy. He couldn't fulfill his status of drumming without the, the, the alcohol. Overweight and out of shape, he struggled to play. I saw him in, in, in uh, struggling in, in recording studios. He was just struggling. Whereas before, you couldn't stop him, you couldn't shut him up. This time, he just didn't have the stamina to keep it going, you know. For Moon, it was a question of shape up or ship out. It was like, Keith, you know, get your act together or, or, or your toast, you know, we're going to get somebody else. And I think to some degree, Maybe this plays back into Keith's insecurities that, you know, the band had existed before him, and maybe there was a threat that the band could exist after him. I put him in a detox uh, clinics at various times in LA and London, but uh, no, it didn't work. They caught him 
drinking aftershave. To help him with his withdrawal, his sleeping problems, and curb his cravings for alcohol, Moon was prescribed hemineverin. He ended up being prescribed this pill, um, I'm sure with the best of intentions, to help him deal with his alcohol withdrawal. Despite Keith's personal struggles, Who Are You was a big winner with Who fans. The boys were back on top. And now, three weeks later, in their London flat, Annette is startled awake by disoriented Keith. It's only 7.30 a.m., and they've been sleeping for roughly three hours. In the early hours of the morning, I woke up, and him, him sort of kicking at me. And I said, what's wrong? What's the matter? And he was hungry again. And he wanted again this, this, this lamb. Annette is unhappy about it. Keith, according to Annette, swears at her. And I was a bit grumpy, but I, I went up and I did it for him. And he ate the lamb. She makes him the meal. She brings it back to bed. Keith turns the movie on again. He takes more of the same pills. He goes back to sleep. By now, he's lost count of how many he's already taken. He started to snoring. He, he was a snorer. And I didn't want to wake him up by kicking at him or nudging him and tell him, yeah, yeah, oi, you're snoring. So I just took my blanket and I went to sleep on the sofa. And he was asleep in the bedroom. And I thought he was asleep in there. I could hear him sleeping. As Moon finally drops into a deep and peaceful sleep, Annette is completely unaware that he's quietly slipping away. London, September 7th, 1978. It's 3.30 p.m. and Keith Moon is still dead to the world. Earlier in the day, he took several handfuls of hemineverin, an alcohol withdrawal medication, and he's been asleep ever since. I woke up. Uh, it was the afternoon. I went into the bedroom, and it was this um, strange feeling when I came into the bedroom because I couldn't hear him breathing. I could. It was just like a, a silence that was like lead heavy, and I could just see Keith with his left arm hanging over the side like that on his tummy, and right there and then I knew something was wrong. So I just darted in there, flew on top of him, turned him around, and I just went into panic. Not knowing what to do, she calls the doctor who prescribed the drugs. At 5 p.m., both the ambulance and the doctor arrive to discover that Moon has suffered cardiac arrest. They try and restart his heart. It's, it's all to no avail, and Keith is very clearly dead and probably has been for a few hours. And they put a blanket over him and carried him out. He, he was gone. At 5.50 p.m., September 7th, 1978, Keith Moon, the greatest rock drummer of his generation, is pronounced dead. They'd been expecting it for years, but it still came as a shock. Partly because he'd calmed down and was attempting to resolve his drinking problem. They announced the death of, of Keith Moon, who died from a drug overdose. And I thought, someone's winding somebody up here. Everyone thought it was actually a huge practical joke, being Keith. At the funeral, was a doctor, he said, he fully expected Keith to jump out of the coffin and go, ha, 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 ha but unfortunately, it was no joke. An autopsy two weeks later concludes that Moon had 26 undissolved hemineverin tablets in his stomach. Was Keith knowledgeable of how many pills he was taking that night? Did he know that he was taking way more than was sensible, way more than the limit? We just will never, ever know. I think people who knew him well uh, we're surprised that he lived as long as he did. He made it longer than Hendrix or Joplin or Brian Jones or Jim Morris, and he made it four more years. <laughs> so that was pretty surprising that he actually lived as long as he did. But of course it's sad, you know, when somebody that huge, that 
bombastic, that alive is no longer on the planet. About 10 days before he died, Keith, out of the blue, phoned me up and said, um, I want you to write my life story. So I go, uh, really? What, uh, yeah, why? Why did he want to write his life story? And then, you know, 10 days later, he was dead. I did find that very strange. The thing with Keith is everybody loved Keith. I mean, they could get fed up with him, but everybody loved him. The Who loved him, his wife loved him, his bodyguard, people who looked after him, you know, had to look after him, really all loved him, and yet they could never really convince Keith of this. They could never really convince Keith that it was all right, that the world loved him, and that he didn't have to keep trying to prove himself. Everyone knows him as Moon the Loon, but what he's left is a legacy of, of drumming, as a drumming technique. That, to me, um, God rest his soul, is what is left. If you take away all the insanity of Keith Moon and just listen to the drums, he's irreplaceable. Kenny Jones, one of the last people to see Keith Moon alive, would go on to replace him as the new drummer for The Who. Ironically, on the cover of his last album with The Who, Keith Moon is shown sitting on a chair bearing the words, not to be taken away. Well, I lost the man I loved, of course. The Who lost the best drummer ever. The world lost um, a character that can't be replaced. Yeah, gosh, and now he was just amazing. <laughs>